So I'm going to just do a very quick introduction for George Belrose, use up some of the time to let the last stragglers come in. Um, George has been a customer at the bookshop since I was just a wee baby owner. <laughs> I felt like a wee baby in my mid-30s. Um, and has always been so gracious um, to me and to the store. And we have really enjoyed um, representing his books. They sell like hotcakes, um, unlike a lot of other books. <laughs> and um, um, I have so much respect for his interest in and curiosity about the people that make Vermont work. Um, and I am really looking forward to his presentation about the logging industry in Vermont and the people who are behind it. So thank you, George. Welcome. Well, well this, this, this is the first for me. Um, I've, I've never had a microphone. I've never had a PowerPoint. And so I have a technical consultant here, uh, <laughs> Helen. Helen Anderson, and her father is John Anderson, who's in the book, but he's not part of this. <clears throat> I have a few prepared remarks uh, just to kind of establish you know, who I am and what I do and what the project is about, and then I'll go on to the slides and the commentary by uh, people in the slides. So you know, first of all, I want to thank Becky um, and the Vermont Bookshop for arranging this talk and for the bookshops, many other events. Every time I enter the bookstore, I realize again how fortunate we are to have a community bookstore that is such a vital part of the community. <clears throat> uh, second, Ned Castle isn't here, but if he were, I'd ask him to stand up and take a bow. Ned created the PowerPoint that you will see uh, based on the Vermont Folk Life Center's 2015 exhibit of Portrait of a Forest Men and Machine. Ned also created the exhibit from the first two years of my five-year photographic documentation. Calling hundreds of images to 50 exhibit prints is not easy. Ned is a master here. Third, there are many, many people to thank. The book's acknowledgments list them. I will also list two. Mason Singer, the book's designer, spent countless hours shaping hundreds of images and thousands of words into 304 pages. Tom Slayton, editor emeritus of Vermont Life, could not have written a better scene setting forward. And finally, uh, thank you to my most, most faithful readers and critics, my wife Paula and our daughter Anne. When I would ask, did your eyes glaze over during my history of the chainsaw? Would you like to read more? <laughs> they would always reply very diplomatically. Uh, <clears throat> And a few words about my background. I've got to take my glasses off. I have been a reporter at big city and community newspapers, a freelance photojournalist, and editor writer at three colleges. I've always been interested in people whose work is not fully appreciated or understood. I believe everyone has a good story to tell if we only take the time to listen. Here, I'm interested in ground level views, not the view from 30,000 feet. I'm interested in the people and occupations that are essential to community life and well being, but who are often overlooked or understood only superficially. It is a cliche, cliche but true, that we increasingly live in silos. In Vermont, many of us are disconnected from the occupations, loggers, farmers, quarry workers that were once very visible and shaped our state. For me, any project starts with the questions, what's the story? How do I tell it? Who cares? <laughs> and my high tech uh, 
sticky paper here. Okay. <clears throat> my obligation is to provide context, but my role is to be a fly on the wall and stay out of the way. I try to be descriptive rather than prescriptive. I try to ask open-ended questions and to frame choices. Why a book on forestry? <clears throat> this project is a companion piece to 46 years of pretty straight going, the life of a family dairy farm. This was also published by the Vermont Folklife Center. Both share the same challenges, long hours, low pay, aging workforce, climate change, loss of infrastructure, global competition. A few words on the process. I start with background reading, such as magazines, books, and reports. I have left examples over here. Um, some would be of interest to, to foresters, others perhaps uh, more, of more interest to the lay reader. A few words on the process, again. I combine this reading with background discussions with foresters, loggers, mill owners, environmentalists, on what should be covered and who are peer-respected people who represent diverse perspectives. I then begin day in the life field photography. I take field notes and share my field photographs with them. And I brought you know, some typical examples of you know, a day spent with John Anderson at Canopy, or a day spent with Ken Johnson, or with TJ and Rick Laporte, and they're hiding in the back. Uh, or with Bob Baird. And let's see who else is there. There's some others, some other loggers, Tom uh, Lathrop. Um, in, many, in many cases, loggers have no or little record of their working days and value this historical record. I then record interviews using the photographs to start the conversation. I edit our conversations, which can run several hours and thousands of words, and send them back for their review. My goal is that they will say, yes, this is who I am and what I do. In the book itself, there are seven sections, and I will, in some cases, describe them in detail when the slides come up. The first section is the early forest. Second section is the old way, the chainsaw. Third section is finding a niche. Fourth section, the woodlot. Fifth section, the new way, big machines. And the ending two sections are the long view and a look ahead. Okay, early history. Let's see if I can, can I, get you to press the buttons here <laughs> so that I can read the, okay. The first is the early history. And part of the book is, uh, I like to have sidebars, historical sidebars, and I call them a look back. Because when you look at history, you say, this problem sounds like something we're facing today. And so, I will read a few historical sidebars that are kind of a lead in to logging throughout history. Come on, page. Okay. And this is a comment from somebody who visited New England in 1638 and 1663. He was John Joslin. And he was simply a, something of a kind of a Wikipedia of his day. He would come over from England and document all the flora and fauna that he saw. Uh, and then he'd go back and, and write the book. And here is a comment that he wrote uh, from his, his two visits. New England is clothed with infinite thick woods. Fast forward about 150 years, 
Timothy Dwight in 1804. He was the president of Yale, and he liked to take, I'm sure if it's a lengthy sabbatical, but he would just go off and not be heard of for a couple months and document, like Jocelyn, here's what I'm seeing in New England and New York. And he wrote in 1804, the forests are not only cut down, but there appears little reason to hope that they will ever grow back. So in 1804, people were concerned we're overcutting. Well, that, that could be a, a stretch, uh, given how rapidly settlers uh, you know, could clear the land. And then I will move up to 1831. Nathan Hoskins, in the history of the state of Vermont, wrote, Vermont has been stripped of her native grandeur. The white pine, the greatest ornament of this and probably any forest on the American continent is principally destroyed. The oak, so highly valuable for strength and durability of its timber, remains but in small quantities. Lastly, the sugar maple has been so diminished by the progress of cultivation that groves of this majestic and valuable tree are now found only on unfeasible or mountainous lands. So people at a very early stage of Vermont settlement were concer concerned about uh, overcutting. And then finally, uh, another pessimistic view. Uh, this is by George Perkins Marsh in 1864 in his book, Man and Nature. And most of you probably know Marsh is often considered our first environmentalist. And he wrote, man is everywhere a disturbing agent. Where he plants his foot, the harmonies of nature are turned to discords. And I'll end with a little more optimistic note. Uh, this is 1917. Um, Amos Eaton uh, wrote, it is claimed that our boasted civilization is built upon iron. But I want to tell you that we are ver very largely dependent on the product of the forest for our existence. And so now, this first section, uh, Jan Albers, uh, I had a conversation with Jan Albers, who many of you may know, who wrote uh, the history of the Vermont landscape. Uh, and she's a wonderful historian. Uh, but this uh, is some different material. And this particular machine here is called the Lombard tractor. And in the early years, uh, a lot of the land that had to be cut was not easily reached. You know, railroads couldn't get in. Uh, it was a long slog for oxen or horse to drag things out to where they could be. Did I just do something? So the Lombard tractor in the early 1900s could tow hundreds of feet of logs on a sled it required very flat land because it had no brakes. Oh. And if it came to a, any kind of a steep hill, they would have to kind of you know, tether it, you know, wrap a cable around a tree to kind of, if it started going fast, they could uh, slow it down with the cable. Uh, so I think any grade had to be under 5%. So that kind of limited its use. And it was dangerous. It could blow up. And, and, and so as soon as they didn't have to use it, they didn't. Uh, and another way in the early days, of course, was getting logs to a mill it was waterways. Uh, and th this came from the Vermont Historical Society. The only thing, the only Information is 1870s Otter Creek near Brandon. And so my assumption is that these logs may have ended up 
in Middlebury. Middlebury was really, as many of you may know, in 1830, Middlebury had the largest population of any community in uh, Vermont, in part because of the waterways, the access to you know, power for sawmills, grist mills. Uh, okay, next. Okay. Tall Trees and Tough Men is perhaps the classic book on what it was like uh, to be a logger uh, from, oh, the late 1800s to the, through the, well, in, in, well, to almost the mid-1900s. And so th these are men at a logging camp. And he, what he writes is, it is true that the majority of old-time woodsmen believe that taking a bath in the winter would bring on galloping consumption, and so forbore. And it is true that some loggers kept putting on one pair of socks over another and one suit of long red underwear over another. The common belief then was that the red was especially warming. And they were quite surprised come spring when they had their first wash to find several layers of socks and long johns that, had, that they had forgotten about. So I recommend that book. Uh, it's over here. Uh, it's, uh, and I'm sure most of the loggers have, have seen it, but it's a great book. Uh, let's see, next. Okay, this is the section, uh, The Old Way, The Chainsaw. And when I first started going and asking people, I'm thinking of doing this project, you know, who would you recommend that I follow? And pretty soon the question always came back, are you going to cover Tweeter Fillion? And at the top of every list was, is Tweeter on your list? And I said, well, I better do Tweeter Fillion. And he was the old school. He started when he was 14. He went through eighth grade. And then he went to work with his father with an ax and a, a two-person crosscut. And then, of course, he later moved on to uh, a chainsaw. Could you? And here's Tweeter on the right. That's his brother Ron in the middle and his son uh, Lester Jr. I'm sorry, Larry Jr. and Larry Fillion uh, on the left. And they worked together for, uh, let's see, 66. Uh, Ron began working with Tweeter in 1982. Uh, Larry Jr. Next. In this, anybody who spent any time in the woods with a logger, that is a pose you'll see dozens of times a day. You know, they're looking up, what's going to come down and hit me on the head? Um, and they are extremely careful about this log or this tree is 100 feet or 125. When it falls, it can affect something way in the distance. And that may spring back. And if you get clunked on the head, uh, you're not going to be happy. So this is a, a typical pose of what's up there. You know, how do I fall it uh, in the safest possible way? Next, please. OK, this is Tweeter talking about his early days. And Tweeter is then 22. And Tweeter was legendarily strong. When you know all foresters are hefty and can pick up pieces of logs that the rest of us wouldn't even think of. But what Tweeter always said is, "I'm strong, but that doesn't make you a good logger. You can't be a macho person and be a good logger. You have to be smart." The tree is a lot stronger than you are. So while Tweeter was known for his winning logging competitions, he always said, that is not the secret of being a good logger. It's using your head 
uh, and understanding the mechanics and geometry of tree falling. Uh, here's what he said. I was born in 1937, right after the Depression. I'm the oldest of 11 siblings, so I know what hard times are. When I started working on the crosscut with the old man, I was small and couldn't bear on it. He'd pull that handle so hard that the blade would fly by and almost hit me in the head. And then I started with the ax, splitting wood, so my father wouldn't have to when he got home. Next, please. His axes were always sharp, and if you messed up on them, you'd get some good bruises to show for it. Okay. And in interest of time, I won't digress anymore. Uh, Steve Weber is on the cover. I like to work. Uh, Steve, as many of you may know, was the college forester for 31 years. And when he first came to the college, he had this offer to buy this piece of land. It was 130 ac 113 acres. He said, I don't know the, what to do with it, but it's being offered for a song. And at some point, eh, it might be worth something. So after he retired, he got together with two of his logging friends. On the left is Rick Laporte, and Rick is back there. And he says, don't ask me to. And on the right is T.J. Turner, and he's back there. Uh, next, please. And here they are working. And this is uh, kind of the old way, you know, like a three-person operation. There's Steve down there. I think, I don't know if he's finishing up a, a tree there's Rick pulling a uh, cable to cinch around the, the log. And then he and his bulldozer will take the, the tree out to a road. And then TJ and his skitter will take it down to the, the yard. And there's the road. It's roughly a half mile uh, down to the, where the, the log truck can come in. And this is a picture to show you. It's pretty low tech. You'll see some shots of other cutting machines later in the section on the new way, big machines. But you can get started the way TJ and Rick started without a huge uh, financial outlay. You buy old. If Fix it, you don't have a lot of debts, and uh, you can make a go of it. Next. OK, here's Steve again. Steve uh, uh, went to Dartmouth, majored in botany. Then he got a master's at Yale. He worked for International Paper for 11 years. Said, I don't want to be moved around constantly. So he came to Middlebury. But in his summers, he always wanted to get out and get his hands dirty. Uh, and here he's talking about one of his summers in college. I wanted to work locally my third summer in college. That was 1961. I bought a secondhand saw, a big home light for 100 bucks, and wrote to a bunch of paper companies and other outfits. Most labor in Maine and northern New Hampshire was bonded Canadian labor because companies couldn't get local people to do that kind of work. What it meant was that any American who wanted to work had priority, but no American wanted to. There were 60 to 70 French Canadians in the camp, and one American, me. And I would ask Steve, how is your French? And he would say, well, yeah, I could get by. Uh, and again, this is, uh, this is TJ. The bulldozer has taken the logs up to the road there. And uh, TJ has rewrapped them. 
and he's going to take them down to the uh, uh, the log yard where the logging truck will pick them up. Um, and I will. Another section will talk about the int intricacies of building a road. Uh, building a logging road is not easy. You can get into lots of trouble. Uh, next, okay. And this is uh, Steve again. Um, I can't do this anymore. I'll be 75 in April 2015, but I hate to even think that I can't keep logging the way I always have. That would be a downward path when I start thinking I can't do this anymore. And Steve died in 2019 after a very short illness and worked right till the end. Next, please. Okay. Another section is if you're going to be a small outfit, you have to have a niche. You have to do something that the big people with economies of scale don't want to touch. And Mike, who lives uh, at the end of East Munger Street in Middlebury, is a master at finding a niche. And he wears a couple hats. Here he's logging in his woodlot in the winter. In the spring, he sugars. In the summer, he hays, and he has a small sawmill. And he also raises heifers. Uh, and the hay he gives to his heifers, and he sells to horse people. Next, please. And here he's in his uh, woodlot. I can make money on that. My trick is that I want to do stuff that nobody else wants to do. I'm looking for the job that the big guys aren't the slightest bit interested in. That way, I can name my price. If you have a 1,000 acres of firewood, the big guys will be bidding top dollar. If you have five acres in the back of nowhere to be thinned, that can be bought real cheap. I can make money on that. Next, please. And here you can see a tweeter in the distance and his tractor. He's off to his woodlot, which is the, the forested area in the center. And though the snowy areas are pasture, and his haying operation. Uh, I like logging. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like logging. Every job has something different. If it's not the logs, it's the market. The truth is you log because you like it. Trying to justify it as a living, which according to the IRS is far below poverty level, is another thing. Next, please. And here's part of his uh, operation. Uh, to the left, you can see some uh, logs that he cut in the winter. Down farther to the left is his sawmill. Uh, to the right is his sugar house. To the right of that are some heifers. And to the right, you know, the forest area, that's part of his sugar bush. Uh, next, please. Uh, Mike. Uh, likes to fix things, especially uh, if he can buy them cheap. Uh, he will do that. And like many loggers, there's hardly anything uh, that they can't fix. Uh, some assembly required. The mill came in several boxes, motor, husk, blade, carriage, track, edger, and a modified state. It really came with some assembly required. About half the mill was original equipment. A cast iron frame is probably 1930s, 1940s vintage, or possibly post-war. A piece or two might go back to 1900. The principles of the circular saw really haven't changed that much in a century and a half, with the exception that motors have replaced water power. Next. OK, there's his circular saw. It's 52 inches in diameter. And I think he thought it was probably 50 or 60 years old. Periodically, someone comes in and bangs it to straighten it out and sharpens it. And then he goes on using it. Uh, next, please. Again, this is low tech. Uh, 
And you'll see shots later on of just the opposite, you know, with lasers everywhere and people in a command module or box and pushing buttons. Uh, but Mike is producing maybe a thousand board feet a day, um, and that's fine with him. Uh, okay, and here he is. Uh, to the far left is his sawmill, He's a storage area there uh, in center, and I believe that's Hemlock, and I, that might be Hemlock going to Ken Johnson at A. Johnson. Wasn't, didn't he do a lot of planks for you? He makes a bridge deck. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was, bridge. Okay. Anyway, if you're a small logger, high-end hardwood is really a neat thing because you can make as much on three big veneer trees as you can thinning 10 acres of low-value weeds. You can have an old dilapidated skitter and chainsaw and go into a fairly small lot and turn out a small amount of very valuable hardwood. Biomass is all about production. Next. And here's more high tech uh, from uh, Mike's Mill. Next, please. And this is, I said I would come back to uh, uh, building a, a road in the forest. And Tom Yeager on the left was the head forester at A. Johnson for many years, close to 40 years, if not more. And one of his jobs, as he said, was I have to feed the beast, and that is keeping the mill supplied with uh, trees to cut. And sometimes they would find a good area of trees, but it needed a road. And so, the challenge was building a road that was good enough for a year or two, but it did not have to have a 20 year lifespan because it wouldn't be used for another 20 or 30 years. So next please, whoops. And this is a little out of sequence, but another job of the forester was planting seedlings. Generally, trees will regrow on their own. Sometimes they won't. And in this particular lot, that A. Johnson owned, they had to plant pine seedlings. Next, please. And this is uh, Paul Fournier starting to move dirt. And here's uh, Tom Yeager talking about what it takes to be a good dozer road maker. Most don't read the landscape. Most loggers think they can put in a road but there are only a few who really know what they're doing. Most don't read the landscape. They make the roads too steep or the turns too tight. They don't get rid of the water the way they should. Ultimately, the old timers are the best because they have built a lot of roads and have a good feel for the machine and the earth. You need a lot of experience to be able to look at the ground at the side of a hill, at the roots of trees, and then stick your blade in and get a feel for what you're running over. So that is part of the challenge and uh, Ken at some point might wanna add to it at the end if there are questions. And, uh, next please. And this is Tom's favorite job. Ken, are you listening? Tom said, this is Ken's favorite thing, having us plant pine seedlings. Is that not true? I know, I know, I know, I know. I was, I was just teasing you. Yeah, and, but no, no, Tom fully understood. <laughs> but he wanted to complain. But no, it was, uh, uh, they were very interested in coming back and see how many uh, in three years, had grown to three or four or five or six feet. So, yeah. Next, please. Whoops, that's repeat. Here is another niche, and that's a portable sawmill. Uh, and Wood Miser is kind of the, the portable sawmill that 
many people use. It's obviously very portable. It's not too expensive. And for small jobs, it's just fine. And Barry Burnham is from Middlebury, and he has one. I'll stick with the diversification. Next, please. Here he is cutting. The building trades are really iffy today. There are so many builders. It's a saturated market, so you have to be diversified to weather the ups and downs. That's why I like running the mill. It's easy. You take this raw material and turn it into valuable lumber. It's just cool. But I don't think there's enough demand year round to make a living at it. Next, please. And here's just his you know, worksheet for that particular job. Next, please. And again, uh, this is low tech. Uh, but for the volume he's uh, sawing, it's fine. Next, please. Tom Lathrop, flooring for 20,000 houses. Tom, as most people know, uh, was kind of the gold standard when it came to flooring. Uh, he was highly respected around the state for the quality of, of the fo his flooring. He was very, very fussy, and his flooring always showed it. And here he is over there on the far left. He's uh, sawing a log. On the right is some of the uh, result of what he's doing. Uh, sawing the unknown. Anyone can run a machine, but can you take the base, best face off that board at the right thickness? That separates the men from the boys. You're cutting into something you can't see. You're looking for clues like grain and a big dark heart. That means the tree has been struggling. Some people never develop the sense that you're not just sawing the outside of the log. You're sawing what you believe is behind it. You're sawing an unknown. I still get fooled, and I've sawn millions of board feet. Next, please. And this shows you a little bit about the operation. You know, trees will come in, they're debarked. That's a debarker in the foreground, and it just gets rid of the bark. You can see the debarked logs there in the center. A uh, front end loader is picking them up and will take them into the the shed, and on the right is the kiln uh, for the final drying of lumber. Next, please. And Tom prided himself on knowing where all his logs came from. He especially wanted to help farmers because he knew you know, anything he could do to help them financially uh, you know, was, was, was something that meant a lot to them. And on the, on the right, uh, that's the start of kind of a, it's like a merry-go-round in which the logs uh, circle through various cutting operations. Tom is in the background making the first cuts of a log. Steve Hutchinson, who's worked for him for years, knows that if Tom has sent me this, he wants it cut this way. It's just, you know, a, a result of having worked together for so many years. And now we're starting to get, get into a little more technology. Uh, the book has a lot more technology uh, in it, but this is a, a sampling. You know, here they're sizing boards. You know, we've got a 12-foot board. What's the best combination? Is it a 6 and a 6, an 8 and a 4? How do we get the maximum value from that board? He does have a laser that gives him some indication of you know, you know, the, uh, what the laser thinks is the optimal cutting. And Tom would often say, I know more than the laser. I don't need it. Uh, and so next, please. Uh, I don't know how many, was it as many as 200 different kinds of floorings? Flooring that you would have, Tom. Uh, wood products. You know, and yeah, and yeah, wood products, yeah, yeah. So Tom just had shelves versus uh, shelves and shelves of 
various options. And here is what I asked him kind of to, to sum up what his life had been like. And he said, I've tried to do it well. Unless you really know the lumber business through and through, I'd advise you not to go into the flooring business. The learning curve is too expensive. If you do, you have to like what you do. You're like, a far you're like farmers or bakers. They rarely get rich. They do it because it's labor of love and a love of hard work. I have really thought about it and have tried to do it well. I love what I do and I'm going to miss it. It's all I have ever known. Next, please. And this is right next to Tom Lathrop, our, oh, OK. Uh, no, th not really right next, uh, just up the, the street. And this is, if you're going into Bristol, as you come into the town and you look down, you may have seen the, the, the mill operation down there. Uh, and this is the Clare uh, Lathrop band mill in 1987 when it was at uh, kind of the peak of its, one of the peaks of its operation. And it was at that point one of the largest sawmills in the state. And that was the fourth generation Clara Lathrop up in the corner. Next, please. And Jim Lathrop, Tom's brother, and all the Lathrops are historians. If you ask a question, it's like, you know, 1893 was just the day before yesterday. And it's like, well, you know, cousin so and so did such and such. Uh, and so here's the, <clears throat> when Jim Lathrop took over the family business in 1994, he placed portraits of the four generations that preceded him on the office wall. Noah, 1848 to 1931, bought spruce thick land in Bristol Notch in 1880, built a water powered mill, that's the mill there, worked the woods with oxen, and created a very profitable niche by selling beams, framing, and fixtures for turnkey barns. He would get the barn ready, put it on a train, and it would go all over New England. Uh, William, 1877 to 1958, was a genius at setting up mills, and then restless selling them, and moving on to start another. Uh, next, please. And that's the wrong caption, but this is Clarence Lathrop in 1940. He would have been the third generation. Clarence Lathrop sawing lumber in his sawmill. It was built on his farm in South Bristol, where he was a successful farmer for many years. And in the early days, farmers often had a small sawmill. Uh, you know, it, helped with cash flow, and if they needed to build a barn, they could uh, get it from their own woodlot to get the lumber. Next, please. And this is Jim, 1948 to the present. Jim takes over the business in 1994 after using his engineering background to create a state-of-the-art mill. After a fire in 2003, he transitions from saw logs to a chipping operation that became the largest in the state. Um, next, please. And here's Jim talking about gradually in starting small and getting bigger as you could afford to. You pay your dues. I started like everyone else with a bulldozer and a chainsaw. That led to a newer bulldozer and a skitter, and that skitter led to another skitter. And then I wound up with a log truck. One bulldozer led to three bulldozers. Two skidders led to four skidders. You pay your dues and work your way up. The only way you could start today and be a chipping operation like us is to have very deep pockets. Machinery is so expensive that if you buy top shelf, you won't be able to make the payments. And you can't just buy one piece because you need four or five pieces.
pieces with it. And that's a, okay, n next, please. Uh, talking about big machines, this is a chipper. It takes a tree, could be 20 inches in diameter. In the space of 30 seconds, it is chips in the back of a big uh, truck. And this is the cutting wheel. It weighs several tons. And that's Jason Lathrop putting in a new, I think there's seven blades uh, in their diamond infested or whatever, but they get dulled by dirt and all kinds of junk on trees. So, you know, when the machine starts to labor, you shut it down, put in new uh, uh, cutting blades. Next, please. Uh, this would be Justin on the left, the younger brother, Jason in the middle. They're sixth generation. And the person on the right has asked them to thin out his sugar bush. And they're doing it in the, in the winter when uh, you know, it's just easier to, to drag things. And they're not as dirty. And the ground's solid. Uh, next, please. OK, this is Justin Lathrop. Uh, we can't afford to buy new. My father never bought anything new. He'd buy stuff that was 10, 15 years old. It could be a real pile of junk, and he'd make it work. The only piece of forestry equipment that he bought new until the very end was the 400G bulldozer and a log loader. He put the loader on a rebuilt truck. But then you could fix things. When I go to machinery expos today, it scares me when I look under the hood. It's all electronics, and I can't fix that. My philosophy is don't buy it if you can't fix it. Whatever we do, there is no way that we can buy new. We will just keep crawling up the ladder with something a little better. That's all we can do. And here's the kind of combination of equipment. This is a grapple skitter here, as opposed to a cable skitter. Cable you wrap around the log. A grapple skitter, depending on the size of the machine, can reach out 12 feet, kind of encircle many logs, and then just pick them up, and off you go. It's a lot easier than pulling a cable. Uh, in the back, there is a feller buncher. And what it's doing there, I think, is delimbing. They have brought trees down from the clear cut that you saw earlier, and they're getting rid of all the, uh, the limbs. And now the feller buncher is bringing down the logs. Some of the logs will end up being saw logs. The others will end up being chips. Next. And here, this is a log that's basically been chipped. There's only a little bit left to it. And it's going into that the truck. And it can take maybe half hour to fill the truck. They drive it to, to Burlington. And it goes to the power plant. And the truck bed will just kind of lift up like that. Or they will have a ramp. So it all comes pouring out the back. Uh, and here is a comment by Jason. I don't know if there will be a seventh generation. The golden age for my brother and me was when we cut together on weekends for 10 years. We worked at the mill five days a week and sold the logs to our father. This was basically a hobby. It was in the woods. We kept it small. We made some money. It was fun. Having been in the business for six generations makes it easier for us today. Our name is known not just in Vermont, but in surrounding states. I run into people who bought timber from my grandfather. I don't hear too many negative things about us, so that's a good thing. I think if you asked around, people would say, those kids work hard. They're always working. We try to be true to our word. If we say we will do something, we do it. I don't know if there will be a seventh generation. I have two daughters. Justin has two sons. They might be interested. Next, please. OK, the ending section is 
uh, I asked five people who were respected in the state for their sense of what it means to be a good steward of the forest. Um, and I asked them to look into their crystal ball and say, what do you see on the horizon? What do we need to do to have a healthy forest in the future? And there are a variety of views here. Uh, this first one is by Paul Costello, executive director of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And for many years, uh, Paul was a leading figure, I think, when it came to, here's what we need to do to, to keep the forest healthy. Um, and so here's a, a comment that he made as part of his longer crystal ball uh, prognostication. The forest products industry feels like it's the neglected stepchild in the Vermont economy. Agriculture and farming are visible. We see and purchase stuff directly at a farmer's market and farm stand from a CSA. We get to know the family. Forestry hasn't told its story as well and is much less visible. There is a very strong stewardship ethic within the industry, but that hasn't been understood because people just see the stumps and big machines and disruption. They don't understand that this cutting is renewing the forest. Next, please. The next person is Jamie Fidel, General Counsel and Forest and Wildlife Program Director for the Vermont Natural Resources Council. And Jamie, again, is one of the most in, in, influential observers of what's happening uh, in the forest and how we get divergent viewpoints to find common ground. Uh, the fabric of Vermont. There are harvesting practices, some happening in Vermont, that may not build a positive understanding of forestry. We need to be honest and tell positive stories of how industry has worked hard to make improvements, that poor stewardship is the exception. We must all collectively agree on what we want. Healthy forests, clean water, local jobs, local woods, a viable economic engine. Working land keeps the fabric of Vermont intact. Both wild and working forests are part of Vermont's character. Next, please. And this is Bill Sayer, along with Ken Johnson. He's co-owner of A. Johnson. And he's speaking here as kind of chair of the Forest Policy Tax Force, the Associated Industries of Vermont. Uh, disconnected from the land. 200 years ago, nearly everyone had direct or indirect contact with the working environment, our farms and forests. In the last 50 years, as society has become more urbanized, people have become disconnected from the land. This is both a problem and an opportunity. We have a good story to tell. The same people who serve on fire departments, select boards, and other community organizations are also the same people who earn their living by harvesting forest products or growing agricultural products. If you weaken any aspect of that rural culture, particularly if you weaken the economic aspect, you will eventually weaken and break down the other aspects of rural life. And the final, okay. And this is Michael Snyder, commissioner of the Department of Parks, Forest and Recreation. Uh, he is now left, but he was commissioner for a dozen years. Prior to that, he was the county forester in uh, Chittenden County. Our best hope. I spent 30 years as a forester working with landowners. Being commissioner for the past three years has given me the chance to see the complete supply chain. We are making progress in understanding the role of force and forestry, but we need greater understanding of all elements, 
bloggers, foresters, mill owners, truckers, retailers, artisans, and the public. Forests provide clean water, the natural infrastructure for our recreational, acti recreational activities, the scenic backdrop for our tourist economy, and ecological resilience during flooding and climate change. I haven't even mentioned the $1 billion plus that wood products add to our economy. It's a major part of our economy and foundational to our rural economy. But we take this green backdrop for granted. When I speak as the foliage guy with the tourism folks, I hammer away that it is not an accident. It's because of the people who work the land. I tell them that working force are our last best hope to keep force as force. And so that is kind of the, the slide, the presentation from, uh, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. There are some loggers, foresters here, and uh, if you like, I can refer questions to them. Don. Picture of the, the logs along the river in Brandon mm -hmm. uh, the, early on. How has the, the mix of logs that would have been harvested back then changed from what we're seeing today? <laughs> the, uh, here is a publication that answers your, your question in great detail. It's called Local Wood, Local Good. And there are pie charts, bar graphs, it looks at everything from you know, 1850 to the present, saying, here's what we used to harvest then, here's what we harvest now, here's what we import, here's what we export, here are the various species that were cut, hardwood versus softwood. Um, and I haven't written the answers on my wrist, but you're welcome to. But that was by the, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation um, had a wood resource analyst, and he spends all his time saying, what's happening? You know, if we're going to make good decisions, we need to know how things are being cut. Are there more loggers, fewer loggers? Um, what is the impact of Maine or New Hampshire? And he really looks kind of globally. Um, there are other things that, like the northern logger, would have that same kind of data. This is what in industry people look at. It's, you know, here's what Quebec is doing. We think China is doing this. Uh, it's kind of to attempt to stay, if not a jump ahead, not two steps behind. Um, and so there, there's a lot of stuff like this. There's uh, the Department of Force website has all kinds of reports on you name it. They've studied it. Uh, the one that's you know the most recent one is about a year and a half ago. The Department of Forest Parks and Recreation uh, hired a consultant to say we need a comprehensive look at what the challenges are facing the forest. We want you to go and talk to everybody, you know, from A to Z. We want you to do focus groups. We want you to come back and tell us, here are the concerns of Vermonters. Uh, you know, here are the problems we see. You know, here are some strategies to deal with them. Here are some immediate actions. Um, and so they came up with 30 action plans. So there's plenty of stuff to, if you want to spend your evenings getting into the weeds. I, I saw something in your book that talked about um, the history of the forest having been cleared and, and cut pretty heavily in the past, and then it actually was beneficial because of the growth of maple. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about how we've seen a change in the type of trees that we would see in the line over you know, the past 100 years. Ken, would you want to tackle that one? Ken knows a lot more about this than I do. 
Ken Johnson. I think the longer it has been more times than it than I have. Okay. I would have thought. I think so. I mean, it used to be, it went from, when Jocelyn went, did his survey, the, the estimate was that perhaps 95% of Vermont was forested. And in no time, I think by 1850, about, and the figures vary and people disagree, but they estimated that perhaps 80% of Vermont had been deforested and 20% was forested. And now it is switched back. Um, if you look at old photographs from the Vermont Historical Society, you'll see bare hillsides. And they're not bare anymore. Or you'll look behind the state house, and it's, there's nothing there. It's just treeless. Um, so the forest regenerates quite quickly. Um, and, and so foresters tend to think generationally. I mean, all the people I spent time with would say, I'm not going to see this cut. It's not in my lifetime. But I want it to be better for the people who follow me. And so many of them would say, I thinned this 30 years ago. And you see that? You know, I marked that tree. And so I do think loggers the loggers that I spent time with really see themselves as stewards of the forest. There were a lot of chestnuts too. Okay. Before the chestnut disease drove it out there. Uh, down the eastern seaboard. It was the dominant tree. Perfect tree. Yeah. Rot resistant. Uh, of just the forest. Now there's almost nothing. It's, well, this isn't quite the. Um, uh, Michael Snyder, who was this last, uh, loved to write because when he was a counter forester, people would say, Michael, what about this or what about that? And so he would write like 700 words to answer the question, and it would appear in, where did it appear? Northern, Northern Woodlands. Northern Woodlands. I thought I had a magazine here. Maybe Becky took it. <laughs> But this often answers the most common questions of, you know, what did the forest used to be like? Um, you know, why did this grow back rather than that? And uh, so it's the kind of, at 700 words, you can read two or three and feel like you've learned something. And of course, something like this story of Vermont, uh, Kleiser and Trump Black are both Middlebury College people. And they get into that kind of, here's how things replaced each other. And of course, here's another book that goes even uh, farther back. This is one of the classic, classic changes in the land, Indian colonists and the ecology of New England by William Croner. I mean, anybody who talks for forestry will pretty soon you'll hear, oh, Croner said. Uh, so those are, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Like I don't know the kinds of plant or tree succession. Um, so I would depend on others that, in the audience who you know, might have you know, more knowledge about that. George, where does the majority of harvested wood from Vermont go? What's its primary use? Oh, uh, da, 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 da. it's in there. <laughs> uh, it's in one of the... Uh, one of the reports? Yes, I mean, I... These guys must know. Uh, let me see if I can. Local wood, local good. This is 2015. 80 per, well, I'll just read a few facts from it while I'm trying to find what. 82% of the forest land in Vermont is privately owned. 87,000 people own that uh, land. Uh, Vermont Forest and Perspective, 12% is hemlock, spruce fir is 9%, white pine is 14%, sugar maple is 23%, a 
red maple is 10%. Red oak is 5%. If your eyes glaze over, I'll stop. Black cherry is 1%. White oak is 0.3%. Um, and here's some, you know, a chart of the harvesting. My guess is the harvesting is probably declining from the peak years. Does that sound right? Oh, I mean, f from say, oh no, just total, total harvest. It's actually been rising as it drops last year. Okay. Um, okay, here's the, the page that you want, Becky. Uh, wood flow, whole tree chips, 13%. Residential and utility round wood and fuel wood, 36%. Saw logs and veneer logs, 28%. And pulp wood for paper, 23%. So that's as of. Yeah, I think firewood is. The, um, and then it talks about how much we export, how much we import. Uh, so, Tom, would you like to add anything in terms of, you know, from your years of experience on what you see ahead? Uh, there's going to be a lot of trees in Vermont because there is a kind of a subtle movement in the school systems and others not to cut trees. They are playing it now as part of uh, global warming weaponization. And it's very sad because the trees will lose. Uh, through disease, they die of old age, release all our carbon. When a large mature tree at the end of its life is uh, starting to die, they will do it from the roots or the limbs. Uh, and you should harvest those trees because uh, the weight of that wood, uh, it's about 50 to 60 percent of it will last forever in a home and that will remain as carbon that's captured and might be an antique piece of furniture 100 years from now or a floor that will last 150 years in somebody's home and that is captured carbon that will be in that home long after that tree would have died and naturally and released all its carbon into the atmosphere. So harvesting mature trees is, is a, the best thing possible. Uh, you make way for the little ones, and trust me, well-managed land in Vermont is, gets enough climate, it's perfect for natural tree restoration. It's just planting of trees unless you want like a conifer monoculture, like Christmas tree farm, or uh, acres and acres of pine trees like they do down south. That's usually not done here in Vermont because it just automatically, the, the such a variety of seeds, and the seeds will last approximately 40 years on the soil before they decompose. So all they need is a little sunshine. And when you take out a big tree or some thing that uh, the wind has damaged or, or a short-lived tree, there's a lot of species that only live about 75, 80 to 100 years. And, and I mean, they have to be taken out of the forest when they're ready to, ready to be cut. Otherwise, you lose all that. Uh, you know, a little bit of money that they would provide. We are lucky enough to live where there's some of the finest timberland in the world. Yeah, that's what your forester, Tom Ager, said. He said, if the glass, glass is only half full, we've got a, a lot of good stuff and that uh, a lot of good logs. And he, he thought, Bob Baird, are you still here? Yeah. Oh, would you want to speak about the future of sugaring? <laughs> Bob is in the book. He has a, a, a wonderful operation. I think you're what, state of the art in terms of your retailing and your internet and your, your videos. And your... No, it, it, that's the next generation. Okay, the next generation. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say um, our sugar bushes, um, a lot. Our farm originally was mostly cleared, mm -hmm. and as it regenerated, um, uh, Tom and Rick 
pretty much spent their whole life harvesting timber and kind of, uh, and especially the last harvest, kind of leaving more of the maples. Um, if it hadn't been for them, I'm not sure that you know the next generation would be on the farm because it mm -hmm. it has allowed a very productive sugar bush. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> some of it being quite young, with a bright future, you know. Um, so almost all of your good sugar bushes are managed forests. They aren't you know wild growth. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and you're, uh, so it's 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 kept our family farm going. Uh, when many others have gone out of business. So thanks, Tom and Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I, I'm happy to... Yes. I've become interested in the history of the merino industry, and there are people who want to say that Vermont was deforested because of sheep, and it sounds like we were being deforested well before sheep were a big deal, so what? How much did the sheep industry contribute to that? Well, I think uh, here is the book that I mentioned, Jan Albers, Hands on the Land. <clears throat> and she talks about the sheep industry. It really had a very brief period. You know, by 1850, it was over, pretty much. Uh, but up until then, you know, Addison County was the largest sheep producer in the country, if not the world, I mean, for its geographic size. Um, but yes, sheep did a, were a prime factor in the, the forest being less of a forest. They were, they were a prime factor? Well, certainly one of the factors. I, I think the, probably the greater one would have been you know, the, the people coming up from Massachusetts and Connecticut saying, there is no land. Uh, and then, well, if I come to Vermont, there's all this land, and they got here, and it was all woods. So they had to get busy. And, uh, and you know, Jan in the, the part of the, the book talks about the settlers came and said, we didn't quite know what we were getting into. We thought we'd just plant and we'd be all set. But, you know, we had to cut and do an acre or two in the summer, and then the family would stay back in Connecticut, and we'd go back in the winter, we'd come back in the summer, and when we had enough uh, you know, to sustain us from our gardens and whatnot, then everybody could move up, and you know, we'd use the, the wood for the, the house and whatnot. But, um, so I would think that uh, it was the farmers who did most of the cutting, and I stand to be corrected. Uh, and uh, if Jan were here, I'd say, Jan, correct me. Uh, but, uh, so there was, you know, a, well, let's see, in, 18, in 1880, there were about 35,000 dairy farms. And, you know, of course, they were all small, and everybody was doing a little bit of cutting, and, of course, now we have under 500, and they're huge. Uh, so it's, you know, the whole trend, whether it's in forestry, it's, I don't know if big is beautiful, but big seems to be the, the trend. You know, you need the economies of scale, or you have to find a niche. And uh, if you're in between, it can be a real struggle. I think it's a struggle for everybody, no matter, you know, your size. Um, and. Uh, you know, there's so many variables now, like China. You know, they can go from a huge buyer to zero. You know, if it's a, a global uh, tariff war or something. So, people have to be very, very nimble, and uh, it's not always easy. Uh, you know, to switch midstream and suddenly say, China's gone. Can I sell to Vietnam or? you know, somewhere else. So, but, uh, so, if there are no more questions, George, as a TJ. Person, as being a timber harvester, I've been about four or five years. Mm -hmm. And when I started just then, I would go home at night and uh, Tommy's dad would call me 
Tom Yeager would call me, mm -hmm. brought them plywood for. Do you have any logs for sale? Mm -hmm. Or we need this, or mm -hmm. we're not doing that anymore. I've, it's it's Canadian market. Don Anderson. There's just nobody left to buy the logs here. A number of mills Very then. Very small amount compared mm -hmm. to what there was from like, you know, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Just a handful of buyers. I mean, they buy a lot of wood, but they're very, very. There's just very few buyers. Mm -hmm. yeah, it I, makes I, it really, really <clears throat> tough on little guys like us because, you know, uh, mechanical operators can fill one of those mills around here in a week. Mm -hmm. It takes Rick and I all winter mm -hmm. to uh, what they can cut in two or three weeks. But yeah, no, I think so. Things have really, really, really drastically changed. But I think you have said you don't try and compete with the big guys. Well, we can. Yeah, that you've been doing had the same clients for like Bob Bear for years, <laughs> and, and uh, others in your area yeah. who, uh, so. and so you don't have to. Well, uh, we're lucky. We've been out yeah, of I mean, you're, we're, that's your kind of niche. We have a small yeah. audience. <laughs> yeah. Sounds familiar. <laughs> the effect of consolidation on all sorts of industries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tom. Can you yeah. relate to that? Mm -hmm. I'd just like to say quite a few things. Uh, my father was quite a historian in the lumber business. And, mm -hmm. and I'll never forget in 1993 when Clinton signed the North American Free Trade Agreement, Grima, my father just went ballistic. He said they have destroyed the lumber industry. What it did is it started this outside of the United States manufacturing sectors to compete with cheaper labor and to put their goods into the American economy. And I mean, you. Uh, when I was a child, I mean, there was Kennedy Brothers, there was uh, Tubbs Snowshoes, and, uh, there was, you know, myself, uh, in Landmark, we, you know, used wood from Vermont Mills to manufacture local products that got used local. And slowly, the secondary manufacturers like myself have dwindled, and the lumber mills no longer have as many local markets to, to sell their lumber to. And the bigger mills, they have survived because they, uh, I grew up with a family that was exporting in the 80s to France, Europe. It was huge because Vermont was on the same latitude of the planet to sell its oak. In England and Europe, uh, they would, Export oak, uh, selling it all the time. I sell them uh, grading lumber to uh, go to the big Canadian foreign mills. And there was hardly any foreign mills here uh, by 1960. And uh, you know, it's, there's been a collapse in the secondary manufacturing, and thus the, the mills don't have place, as many places to sell their lumber, the smaller mills. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, we've been starved now. You have to have a, a market, and, it's, and it affects these loggers because they don't have all of the extra mills that were looking for certain mm -hmm. products to, to feed their customers what they needed. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a real struggle, but it's a global thing. It's just happening, especially <laughs> around the ports, uh, along the, the borders of mm -hmm. this nation. Inward, like Kentucky, uh, Indiana has not been affected so bad, and Pennsylvania, because they're so far from the border, the trucking cost mm -hmm are different and it, and it makes up for the difference but you know when you've got countries that will pay people pennies a day to work just for food it's pretty hard to compete on that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah I think that's what the strategic roadmap is attempting to address. What can we do yeah. given this state of the economy and, and the forest products business? How can we help? Because when you keep the mills here uh, we used to sell all our sawdust and, and shavings went to the uh, Four Hills, a local farmer. Now they've got to go to Canada mm. because there's no more left. Mm. All the other mills, if they, whatever sawdust they make, they use it in their boilers or mm -hmm. sell it to farmers near them. And, and it just drives people further and further away mm -hmm. to get the products to keep going. Well, we'll, have to, we'll have to come back in 10 years and see. Check it out. <laughs> Oh, am I making all kinds of things? Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. No more mic for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
think that what, what we've learned here this evening is we all have a lot to learn from each other. And I have not heard this kind of perspective from anyone else. So I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say. And to George for sharing a few photographs.